So I'm Robert Scoble, and we just got back from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where uh, you know I, I'm looking for uh, companies that are pushing this contextual age forward. Because I wrote a book on uh, context, where sensors, wearable computers, big data, social network data, and location data all get fused together to make a new kind of operating system possible. And today we're going to talk to sensor platforms about what they can sense from coming from the sensors in your cell phone, and what can they, can they do with that. It's really interesting stuff. Who are you? All right. Well, I'm Kevin Shaw. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Sensor Platforms. And um, you know, a little bit about myself. Um, I've got a PhD in MEMS, which a lot of MEMS design, brought up semiconductor fabs for MEMS. Um, and uh, work in a company doing really cool stuff down in San Jose. Yeah. You know, trying to say, you know, we've got all these sensors everywhere. I spent 20 years building sensors. Now let's do something useful with them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, we used to say, someday we're going to have lots of people using them. What, what is MEMS? Because I, I know oh, what it I'm is. Sorry. I, I'm just so buried no, in the field. So MEMS are micro electromechanical systems. Yeah. And they're those ultra tiny little widgets, you know, a couple of microns in size. If the human hair is about 50 microns, so thinking about these things is a fraction of the width of those. Yeah. And we can actually make mechanical systems, just like engines and things like that, but we can make them really small. And it turned out one of the coolest things we can do with them is just to do something really simple, measure acceleration. Because acceleration means I can understand where gravity is, yeah. I can know how much you move, I can know how much you turn, and what a, you know, same thing that they did with uh, aircraft or with cars. So it's really making tiny sensors. Turns out you can make them really cheap, and you can do them with really low power. Yeah, and there, there's what, seven sensors on your cell phone, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, some people count, uh, you can actually count 17 to 18 sensors of these, if you consider the, the radio frequency sources. But if you're looking at the MEMS, the, the classic ones, yeah, there's like seven or eight of those in there. Yeah. It's amazing. And the new phones, like our iPhones, and the, I think the Samsung have uh, new motion processors. Yes. So they can actually watch your motion or your accelerometer. Um, it, it, in a deep way without turning on the main processor, right? Well, that's one of the interesting things. I mean, the, one of the old rules in the semiconductor industry was there'll always be one chip that'll absorb everything. And that was usually the application processor or the CPUs we have on our desktops. And everything else slowly but surely just sort of gets absorbed into it. One of the strange things in phones is there are some chips that are holding on their place outside. And that's what these sensor processors are. They're actually a low power thing that says, I'm going to turn off the main processor as much as I can, much like the Apple did with their M7. And I'm going to leave this one on all the time. Yeah. And that way it can know the fact that I'm not holding it right now. And know the moment that I pick it up and start walking out the door. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> what is it that your company does? Sure. And, and so it, sensor platforms, yeah. we're, we're a sensor company. Or a sensor software company is my best description for it. Right. Um, a lot of people get confused. They're like, you know, can we buy sensors from you? Well, no. We, but we do the software that wraps around them. Okay. And so that software allows the sensors to make sense, do something useful that allows applications to understand them. Yeah. The, the physics behind them gets kind of kind of gnarly. Now today, I, you know, I have a Samsung and an iPhone. And neither and a Moto X. Yeah. N none of those really mm -hmm. understand my context. Not I, yet. I, I know that Google's working on a contextual operating system, mm -hmm. and Qualcomm is, and yes. uh, working on context, right? They have the gimbal, gimbal API, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and there's others that are trying to figure out, are you walking, running, skiing, driving, biking, shopping? Because if oh, I know yes. what you're doing right now, I can cert change the apps on top and do things with you. And right? it goes even beyond that. I mean, you only have your phone on in front of you one to two hours a day. Yeah, but me it's a little really, bit longer. Well, sure. I mean, I've got mine <laughs> attached to me. I'm in Silicon Valley. It goes with me everywhere. But it doesn't know much about me once I put it into sleep mode. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's connected to the cellular network, but it really doesn't know whether I'm holding it right now or not. And so context is saying, well, let's understand more about you the rest of your life. Now, there's always that freaky line that you keep talking about. You know, how much do you want the phone to know about you? But is there's enough of a payback if you yeah. get something for it you know, who would have thought we'd actually carry phones around with us everywhere anyway? Because yeah. wouldn't that be strange to have a voice talking to you whenever you wanted? Yeah. And now it's just sort of part of our life. 
Can, can you show me a demo of sure. what, what your uh, software is able to do mm -hmm. today? Now, you're not yet shipping in a shipping product, right? You're um, just sort of just starting in, to announce the availability of your stuff to OEMs mm -hmm. like, like a Samsung or a Th There's Apple different here. types of software. Um, <laughs> something okay. called Sensor Fusion. We've been shipping that for several years. And there's quite a few products that actually are running our software and shipping in volume right now. Okay. Uh, most of those companies like to call it, put their own name on it and brand it as their own. And so most people don't know about us. Um, but right now with our context awareness software, uh, that'll probably be announcing, we've already announced relationships with NVIDIA, uh, Qualcomm, excuse me, uh, QuickLogic, my mistake. So yeah. NVIDIA, QuickLogic, uh, Atmel. Um, and so we announced relationships with them. Um, we have more that we'll be announcing at Mobile World Atmel Congress. Atmel makes the sensor that goes into the Samsung phone. Yes, they do. Atmel makes a very low power cores, um, and so they make the one that goes into, for example, the, the Galaxy S4. So what are we about to see here? All right, so we've got an app running <coughs> that's going to look at the sensors in this. And so I'll go ahead and turn on the, the demo here. Yep. And this thing is going to just wake up and it'll take a look at this. Now, what it did is it just looked at the sensors in, my, uh, in the phone. And it said, well, you know, there's vibrations in my hand. They look human. It looks like a human's holding this phone right now. If I take it and put it down on the table, it says, well, these vibrations don't Mama, look. Person. It looked at the vibrations and says, this isn't, you know, I don't think I'm being held right now. And if I take this and pick it up and hold it in my hand, in hand front. it looks at those and says, this really looks like a human's holding it. Wow. And it's doing it just using an accelerometer. And so this gives you an idea what we can do. We can also do things that include putting it in a pocket, yeah. standing up and walking around. We're kind of short on space person. standing. But think about also the power implications. You know, uh, my, my dad calls me and you know, he, he, he you know, does a pocket dial for me. He doesn't put his phone to sleep. To him, the computer should figure that out. Well, this is an example of it. When you put it on the table, it should turn itself off. Yeah. So what? What context can you sense? You can sense in a pocket, on a table, in your hand. Can you sense that I'm running or biking or yes. driving? Yes, or there's, like there's a hundred of them that we can come up with and well beyond that. Um, you've talked about ones like standing up and walking. Um, but there's also things like going uh, into an indoor building, going into a shopping mall, knowing that I'm standing in line, knowing that I'm at a coffee shop, uh, all starting to shop. Um, all of these things are things that start to become possible when you understand it more about what this phone's being held and what you're doing with it. Yeah. Um, and they include the things, I mean, we've already talked a little bit about Nest, for example, you know, with the Google acquisition there. Yeah. Um, they bought that because it gives them insight into the home. Yeah. Nest is really a contextual processor for the home. Yeah. It knows when I there, come home at night. Most people don't know that there's a motion sensor on the Nest yes. thermostat, so it knows when I walk Mm -hmm. buy it and I have the smoke detector as well yes. or mm -hmm. carbon monoxide smoke detector and it also has a motion sensor so now Nest has two motion sensors mm -hmm. both of which happen to be aimed pretty close to my front door so it knows yeah. when I come in yeah. and when I leave you know <laughs> and soon I'm gonna have other uh, smoke detectors in the house in other like in the and kitchen and in the living room allowing yeah. machines like this to understand this means when I walk out the door in the morning it turns off the heat yeah. And it doesn't just turn it on at five o'clock in the afternoon hoping I will come home. It'll wait till I come home and understand, oh, the person's home now, or yeah. they're home early. Yeah. So this actually Well, changes. Waze, Waze, which is also owned by Google. Oh, I love Waze. Knows, I use it twice a day. <laughs> right. And, and it knows I'm heading toward home because I actually tell it, take me home, you know? Yes. Because I want to, I want to know where the cops are and where there's uh, hazards on the road and stuff ahead. Or I want it to route m me around traffic. You know, if, if Highway 92 is completely closed because some 18-wheeler went overturned, exactly. I don't want to go near there. I want to go at some other route. And it usually is. Waze is pretty good about routing you around and telling you that something is uh, bad uh, happening up ahead. So go go to dinner or something. You know? So, you know, and the same thing goes with the the wearable type things that yeah. we have. You know, it's, we were talking a little bit earlier about how... This is the Shine, the Misfit Yeah, this Shine. is the Shine from Misfit. Yeah. Um, it's an amazing device, and what I love about it is, you know, one, it tracks my steps, knows when I run, knows when I go to sleep, but the thing runs for six months on one battery. No right. battery change for six months. That's amazing, and that, that's the way these things should be. I shouldn't have to take it off and plug it in and hope that I remember to put it back on. Yeah. So, with this, I walk more. You know, I don't just 
drive down to the Starbucks. I walk there. And I gave these to my parents as well because now they also start to think about, oh, well, I probably should take that walk. Now, when you have 200 million people in a country all doing 5 10% more walking, you actually start to change society. You actually make people healthier. Yeah. And small little things like this can actually make huge changes in big ways. Yeah. Now, you're not, um, you're wrapping the sensor with a layer of software that does some basic uh, contextual stuff, but you're not doing like Google now, you're not looking inside my email and looking no, at my Facebook no. behavior and my Foursquare behavior and no. my social behavior mm -hmm. on Twitter maybe, uh, like, like Google now is, is starting to, Google now is certainly looking at my calendar and my, mm -hmm. um, and my email and, my, and some of my search behaviors uh, to do things, like it tells me the 49er score, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, how did it know that? Oh, I searched on the 49ers <laughs> one day, you know, and, and then I figured out that's my favorite team, right? And so, um, uh, there's a lot of social behaviors that you guys, you're more about just studying the, the MEM sensor and doing something yes. with that. Right? And we view those as soft sensors. There's yeah. other people that can do that ever so well. I want to be able to sort of gate those other sensors with a very low power sensor. So what I mean is the fact that I've been sitting here this whole time yeah. means I'm not moving. And if I'm not moving, I don't need GPS on to geofence. You know, my GPS tells me when I'm near my local Starbucks, which is really cool. I walk up and a little green banner yep. says, welcome to Starbucks. Yeah. I'm not there now and I'm not moving. So do I need GPS on to tell me that I'm not moving? No. Well, I can do that with a sensor that takes 100x less power, give me a longer battery life and give me more functionality. So we really view ourselves as being the low power sort of ability to gate other sensors. And we can tell you when you get up and start walking. Yeah. Because when I start walking, I probably need to use geofencing. Yeah, you can also uh, fill in, help fill in the gaps where GPS doesn't reach, like inside a, a building, right? Because you actually know that I'm walking in, that I <coughs> walked into a mall. The GPS, you know, told me that Absolutely. I'm at that door, and then uh, from then you can tell how I'm walking through that mall and sort of make a rough guess of where I'm. Mm -hmm. uh, where I am inside that's the That's the whole right? indoor navigation problem, which is equally fascinating. Yeah. Um, we think that's probably going to hit later this year or, or starting next year, where everyone loves the blue dot on the map. I mean, if I turn up my map, it'll show me a blue dot, and people are addicted to that. But it doesn't go indoors right now. Yeah. And finding a way to take it indoors, because GPS is phenomenal. But when I walk inside, it's not that I can't see the satellites but there's so many reflections going through the four or five walls that the signals get all muddied up. Yeah. So if there's a way for this device to use those sensors, the MEMS sensors, so that when I start walking, it knows that I'm walking down the hall, turning right and going into a Starbucks. Okay, now I can follow that little blue map, little blue dot on the map. And when I go up on multiple floors, go three floors up in the shopping mall, it knows I see a different set of stores. Yeah. And so allowing it to choose the map based on where I am it, so it can tell I'm walking upstairs, right? Yes, yes. My is, Fitbit did, did that as well, right? Yes, these use something called a barometer or a pressure sensor. They're phenomenally accurate. They measure the air pressure difference between here and here. Wow. To say there's enough of an air pressure difference between the two that when I pick this up, it can measure that. Wow. It, it's amazing. I didn't know that. It, it's absolutely amazing what they can do. This is also a MEMS technology. Little diaphragm, much like a, the surface of a drum, um, as you go up, the dr drum bends a little bit more or a little bit less, and you can use that to identify air pressure changes. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. Um, so, you know, the car has a whole bunch of MEMS. Your, your uh, yes, airbag sensors yes. are MEMS, mm -hmm. right? Are you looking at uh, building just for the cell phone, or are you looking at building software it's for really all sensor MEM sensors around the world. Yeah, you know. that brings up the question of sort of a sort of a distributed approach to this whole uh, solution. You know, we're going to have this with us all the time, and I think that if I carry this with me in my hand on my person, I can get very valuable information getting up to the car, getting into it. So I think that's very valuable. And if you can, much like we're seeing, have the phone communicate with the car, I can share that information and actually allow it to work together. Uh, I think that makes a more a richer approach. So we probably won't work with in the cars directly, but we'll be able to bring you to the car. Yeah, uh, certainly some of the car companies are already building contextual cars. Uh, Mercedes was one at mm -hmm. the Consumer Electronics Show that is building uh, sensors in the car to know where you're sitting in the car and mm -hmm. 
know uh, your pattern. Well, that's actually a really tough problem is knowing yeah. whether you're in the driver's seat or the passenger seat. Yeah. That's a really tricky one. Yeah. Because one person's allowed to use Waze and the driver, well, I'm not allowed to use Waze while I'm driving. Yeah. And I never would, of course. I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see where the, all the accents are coming? Yeah? I love I love ways while driving actually. Um, how do you guys make money? I, are you going to sell uh, your technology to an OEM for a few cents per per? Uh, you know, for business models like that are a real challenge. You know, when we go into the app space, you know, you're trying to find your way into a freemium model. It's really tricky. Uh, when we're working in the hardware space, as we often do. Uh, it's really a lot easier. You can count the number of chips going out and say, I'm in each of those, you know, let's, you know, let's do the multiplication. Uh, so business models like that are certainly much easier. Um, but, you know, the rest of it, are, it's, you know, as we were saying, is sort of a turbulent times and those are tough to figure all those out. Yeah. When I met with the strategists from Samsung, they're still unsure whether uh, contextual features are going to be something consumers care about. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, what's your answer to that? Because I'm sure you're pitching a lot of OEMs oh, yeah. and explaining why this matters. You know, I think his statement is true. I don't think people care about context. They just care about this little device knowing them a little bit better. The, the, the old days, you know, when you first, remember when you first saw a phone, you could turn it this way and that yeah. way. It's like, wow, this is so cool. You didn't know that there was an accelerometer in there. You just know that it knew when you turned it. And now that the fact that the maps move as I walk, it seems to know where I am. We can talk about the technology behind it all day long, but no one cares. Yeah. And so I don't, we'll argue no one really cares about the context either. They just know that when they pick up the phone and they're in their car, it already knows that they're driving home. Yeah. They won't, it just knows that it seems to know them better yeah. that the consumer companies will pay. They'll be very interested in that. Yeah. They will pay a lot of attention to that. And I think that's the coming war between Google and Apple and Samsung and Microsoft and all mm -hmm. those. How, how personalized is the phone? How easy is it to use? That's the per difference. You know, it, uh, it Go Motorola with Moto X was, uh, you know, you could even talk to it without touching it, right? Okay, Google now. Um, I think uh, that's know. brilliant. And that's the beginning of always on. We talk about it a lot in our particular industry, having the sensors always on. Because right now, this phone's asleep. And most people argue that it's, it's off. Well, actually- the, It's not the, quite off. The baseband processor's on. Yeah. It's chatting away with the local cell networks to make sure that it's ready for communication when you are. So there's other sensors in there. There's a power management chip that's always on. So turning these things always on, more of it, much like the acoustic sensor. The Moto X had a, a voice processor called acoustic trigger. And when you say just the right words to it, there's a little sub-processor that just listens for those words. That's all it does, just listens. When it hears you say, okay, Google now, it wakes up a lot of other stuff and says, and a command is coming. And so that sort of partitioning question of how you implement that and not use up the battery is one of the big questions. Yeah, I think we're gonna see more features like that because uh, that's how you differentiate your phones from yes. Apple or from yes. Samsung or whatnot, right? And I think the consumers win. Yeah. Because you see more interesting features. I'm seeing more contextual apps on Android than on iPhone, partly because it's more it's, it's open, more open. More open. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, the the app developer that's sitting up here. You guys are sitting down here, yeah. close to the processor, but the guys up here can uh, talk to the dialer, mm -hmm. can talk to. Um, mm -hmm. um, it can change the contacts mm -hmm. more easily and uh, can change the home screen and ch and even get into the apps. Where on Apple, they're really uh, closed. They, do, they don't want you to do a lot of that you know, That's stuff. a really interesting one. I, you know, I personally use an iPhone. I, I love the yeah, environment. I'm, I'm a big fan of them. Um, and they've done some really intelligent things. The, the M7 that they put in there, a motion processor, I think is, is absolutely brilliant. And that feeds into our whole conversation here, having a separate piece of silicon that identifies and is always listening. We find Android, though, much easier to hack, much easier to work with. Um, we can actually go in there, recompile the kernel, install services that are always on and do some really amazing things. Yeah. So I'm sure Apple is going to follow along. They're really smart. They're really capable. And they have the silicon they can put stuff into. Yeah. You guys are not all that concerned about all the privacy. Because every time I give my speech, people yeah. ask about privacy. This stuff freaks me out. It, you know, I would, I, I, I'm not sure that I want this, right? Because uh, there's a lot of, I mean, this thing is going to know when I'm having sex or when I'm <laughs> going to 
<laughs> someplace I'm not supposed to be going, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it knows a lot of data about who you are and what you're yes. doing that you might not want your boss to know or yeah. your insurance company or mm -hmm. your government or uh, your coworkers, it's a, it's right? It's a really interesting problem. On the one hand, we certainly worry about that. If you had told someone from 100 years ago you'd have a box in your hand that the voice from a neighbor could come walking through and talk to you, you would have found that bizarre. Um, now I carry her around with me and I can talk to anybody on the planet at a moment's notice. It knows where I am. Um, so I, I think privacy-wise, if I can keep everything local, which is a, sort of a strange concept in this world, this has my telephone numbers, yeah. it has my mail, and it knows what I'm doing. If I keep that local here and I have control over it, then I have a feeling of privacy and control. Yeah. Um, and that's why our whole effort is to do, we're gonna identify events locally. Yeah. We'll let the apps make the decisions of what's relevant and what to do with it. And that's a good way to save pat battery too, because Absolutely. anytime you want to take a little bit of data and put it on a cloud mm -hmm. server, it, it's costly, right? I mean, battery wise, you have to wake up a, a bunch of systems yes. that weren't woken up. Your, your biggest power hog is often a wireless transport. Right. Sending data up is really the expensive part. Interesting. Tell me a little bit about the company and uh, oh, sure. and how so, is, is it funded and how many people work there and what stage? So is it? Sensor Platforms were you know about nine year old company. We're so venture not, backed. Not really a startup. Anymore. I know, but we sort of like to think of it. We still have piles of food in the kitchen, and um, you know, we're still only about twenty people, so we still view ourselves, and we still work insane hours. So it sort of feels like a startup. Yeah. Um, but we're about nine years old. We're venture backed. Uh, we had the same investors all the way through. Yeah. Who um, are they? We have a Newberry, okay. we have Aeropath, and New Science Ventures. Oh, very and cool. so they've been uh, real supportive um, and uh, just been rolling along really well. Yeah. It shows, uh, you know, to have an overnight success in Silicon Valley, you have to work for 10 years, right? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You know. And you also sort of have to wander around in the space. We yeah. didn't start doing context nine years ago, yeah. we started doing silicon for sensors. And then we wrote the algorithms for them. And then we, we have adapted. And I think that gives you a richness and a depth of understanding for a particular market. And then you have to be there at the right place at the right time. Uh, uh, timing is really important here. Yes. You know, because uh, the cell phone caused all this R&D to be done mm -hmm. to make things really, really small because it has to yeah. fit in your hand, right? This is more compute power than yeah. the astronauts had on, <laughs> on all their systems yes, put like together. Orders of magnitude. <laughs> you know? And so there's a lot of R&D that's going into making uh, things smaller and adding new features and cars are doing the same kind of R&D that uh, mm -hmm. they need 30 sensors to run a modern yeah. car today. Um, and, and you guys had to wait for the sensors to come down in price yes. enough to make your, your I mean, business when started, interesting. When I started doing MEMS micromechanics, accelerometers were a couple dollars per axis. There's three axes in most of them. Yeah. Now it's 30 cents for a complete three-axis accelerometer. It's digital, too, with all the capabilities we could want in it. And those are now just going everywhere. Um, so you, know, you start getting them into the wearables. Uh, you, know, you start putting them in, uh, they're talking about tens of billions of these things going out there. Once they're that cheap, suddenly you start discovering things you could do with them. Yeah, Estimos is headquartered right outside my mm -hmm. studio here, and they're putting uh, sensors into the low energy oh, Bluetooth yes. beacons that they're gonna put all over the world. So. That's gonna be ever so powerful. Just that's just going to be really a big thing. Um, uh, I can't wait. It's uh, going to be fun to watch you guys. And where do we you. learn more about you guys? Uh, um, well, um, we're at www.sensorplatforms.com. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun watching what you do and what comes out at the Mobile World Congress in a couple of weeks. Because well, I have excited. a feeling uh, <laughs> some of your technology is going to show we're, up. We're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to it. Very All cool. right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate your time.